confession to make, okay? I'm not sure I was ever totally and unequivocally secure in my salvation. Now, let, let me explain that before you start thinking the way you're thinking right now. <laughs> okay? What I mean by that is I never, ever believed God would leave me nor forsake me. Never. I know what the word says. I get it. Never. That's, that's Hebrew for I won't drop you or let you go. It literally means I won't let you go. That's what it means. Never leave nor forsake. Forsake is a very, you know, very fancy word. But if you look it up in the Hebrew, leave and forsake, it means I won't drop you. I won't drop you. I won't let you go. You follow? You got to get the picture. Okay, I believe that. But I believed at times, not, not all the time, not even close, at times I walked in a little bit of fear and condemnation. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? If, if you could raise your hand so I don't feel like I'm alone. Okay. If, if you didn't raise your hand, please write a book so I can read it. I'm talking about, I'm, t I'm not, t listen to me. Don't, if you're living in a sinful life, you need to repent like yesterday. Yeah. But I'm talking about when you fall short. Let's say you lose your temper yeah. at your kids. Not that I've ever done that. I'm just giving you an, <laughs> I'm trying to give an example. And then the guilt comes over. Yeah. And then the condemnation comes after the guilt. Now, guilt to make you repent is healthy. You can't repent unless you feel guilty. Yeah. Right? You can't. It's fake repentance. It's not going to be real. So you've got to have some sense of guilt in order to repent. Guilt brings you to the door of repentance. You repent, forgiveness gets you through the door. You follow what I'm saying? You got the picture? So if you never have any guilt, either you're perfect or something's radically wrong. But it's when after you repent that you don't walk through the door and you stay guilty, that's condemnation. Does anybody know what I'm talking about? Please don't make this a church service. I'm okay, you're okay, and we'll go to lunch at noon. Please, that's not going to work for me. I want to get something done here today. I want the Lord to have his way as usual. So you know, you know what I'm talking about, right? Okay. Good, so we can start. Now, by the same token, because of that attitude that I've had, it's helped me not walk in what I call Christian pride. You ever see those folks? Yeah. Cocky in their salvation? Yeah. Like they don't read in Philippians about working out your salvation with fear and trembling. They don't read that. Now what does that mean? That doesn't mean to shake. It means a healthy, you hear what I'm saying? A healthy, let me say it one more time, a healthy fear. A healthy fear of offending God through disobedience. If you don't have that, I'm here to tell you something's wrong with your walk. If you're not concerned about offending God through, not through, through disobedience. So that part worked out really well for me. Because it kept me from doing a lot of things that I would have ordinarily. It wasn't my, in my real life, it wasn't my father's teachings. It was my father's beating. That kept me from doing certain stuff. The discipline. The correction. Remember what happened to Eli? He did not correct his children. And it caused him to break his neck. Literally. He broke his neck. He taught his kids. Oh, he was a good teacher. But I think he messed up in two areas of his life. One, he did not discipline them appropriately. And he didn't walk his talk. So that part was good. However, condemnation is poison. Now, I'm, I wrestled with this thing. You don't even know. I woke them up. Yes, they're yelling. How do I do this? Because there's a fine line. When you tell people not to walk in condemnation, they get cocky. And they can get licentious. And God, oh, he'll forgive me. He loves me. If, if, if you don't go there at all, if you don't approach it, then they walk in fear all the time. 
and borderline afraid of God. Afraid of messing up because he might kick you to the curb. I know these stories. I know the stories of the parents that say, I should have never had you. You know, you know why I know that? Because I visited him in jail for 10 years in Florida. Every time I went to the prison on Friday night and had a Shabbat service, every single guy told me that. Yeah, my dad threw matches on me and he burned me with cigarettes. I said, I should never have had you. You ruined my life. That's real. We don't want that relationship. So guys, today I'm walking a very fine line and I'm scared poopless. So I hope you can appreciate that honesty and that reality of me wanting you not to walk to be free this season of Passover and yet not be cocky in your freedom. How do I do that? I have no idea. No idea. So I'm going to give you what I think God gave me and then I'm going to let him do what he does, which is what I can't do. Okay? I'm going to give you what I think is maybe one of the most important messages I've ever given in my life. And I'm hoping he will do what you need him to do. I'm not shucking the responsibility. I'm just saying I can lift him up, but only God can draw. That's his department. So I'm going to do my part. Let him do his part. Let's go to the first set of scriptures in John 10. Now, you know this section all too well because people have quoted it eight million times. Yeshua says, my sheep, okay? He's talking to his sheep, not the world. Amen. You're his sheep, right? right? Okay. This is how you know if you're his sheep. You listen to his voice. Oh, God doesn't speak anymore. Oh, oh my goodness. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? My sheep listen to my voice. I recognize them. I know them. If you look up that word in the Greek, kenose, it literally means from the Hebrew, like to have intercourse. It means to be so intimate with the Lord. It's like spiritual intercourse. I recognize them, or I know them, some of your versions say. I know them. Remember what he says at the end of his sermon? I don't know you. They follow me. That's how you know. Not only do you hear his voice, it's great to hear his voice, but it's great to obey the voice. So look how rich, and I give them eternal life. That's, that's the icing on the cake. That's not the foundation. See, for most people, it's their foundation. They walk up, they get saved, and then they start teaching Sunday school. You've been saved five minutes. How are you teaching Sunday school? I wouldn't let you teach Sunday school for years. What do you know? It's crazy, right? But we're so desperate. Hey, he's breathing. Here's a Bible. Go teach that class. See, the eternal life is not the foundation. It's, it's being communing with God. That's the foundation. Heaven's not the foundation. It's communing with God forever. Uninterrupted fellowship for eternity. That's the gift. That's the blessing. I'd rather be in hell with the Lord than in heaven without him. They will absolutely, I mean, how much more emphasis could Yeshua make? They will absolutely never be destroyed. And no one, not even you, no one will snatch them from my hands. Guys, you got to start reading the Gospels. You got to read the Gospels. If he's your Lord, then read what your Lord has said. Now, it goes on to talk about, and no one will snatch them from my father's hand. So you get this picture. How many of you, I did it with my kids. You know what I'm talking about? See, you raise your hand already. I said, how many of you? I, I did. What? I don't know. <laughs> Pavlov's dog. Amen. Amen, brother. Preach it. I didn't say anything. How many of you with your children, you and your wife, grabbed their hands and swung them? How many? You ever drop them? I'm man enough to admit that Bernard and I have. But if you look at my children, they're fairly normal, all things considered.
Now look, look at the word hands, just so you know. It's, it's a physical hand, but obviously it's, it's figurative. Because God is spirit, so he can't hold you with a spiritual hand. Right? He, he's making a point figuratively. It's symbolic. This is a word that's used symbolically. Okay? Applied to God, symbolizing his might, his activity, meaning he's involved with us. He's holding on to us. Sometimes we say, God, I can't hold on. Who asked you to? The whole idea is to let go. Why are you still in control? You know that book, God is my co-pilot? I got news for you. If he's your co-pilot, I ain't getting on your plane. God is my pilot. I'm just happy to be on board. He's steering this thing. His activity, he's involved. He's the risen Lord. And he has power. Great power. How dare we ever forget his power. How dare we question his power. Why? Because you didn't get the answer you wanted. Your, your, your answer to prayer didn't come fast enough, so God's not powerful anymore? Yeshua says, when we are born again, we receive the gift of eternal life. We just read that, right? Not temporary life. It says eternal life. If you stop believing his words, where do we go from there? This means it's everlasting. It says, and they shall never be destroyed. If any sheep of Messiah Yeshua could be destroyed, then he lied. Can we live a sinful life as a believer? This is what I think. If we were really born again, we wouldn't have the desire to. You're catching me today at 60 years old, 30 years of living totally crazy secular for myself. And 30 years living totally crazy and spiritual for the Lord. And I'm here to tell you that there was a great change when I used to plot evil on my bed, now I plot righteousness on my bed. Because I'm born again. So, the answer, can, can we live a sinful life, a totally sinful life as a believer? I don't know why we'd want to. We don't live a believer's life in order to become a believer. Or in order to maintain our salvation. We live a believer's life because we're believers. We desire to live a holy life. Not out of fear of losing our salvation. But out of gratitude to the one who died for us. The doctrine of eternal security does not encourage careless living. But rather is a strong motive for holy living. No one will snatch us from his hands. These were the hands that made the heavens and the earth. These were the hands that shaped the universe. Everest. Grand Canyon. The hands that hung the stars in their place. The hands that not only created the world, but the hands that sustain the world and hold it together. God held my 12 by 8 centimeter aneurysm together. It defies medical understanding. And he revealed it to me in the shower. Not no test. He held it together. I will not die a day before I'm supposed to. And I won't live a day longer than I'm supposed to. I will go when he receives me and calls me. Someone who is born again, John 3, 3, cannot be unborn. God does not abort his babies. After being adopted in God's family, Romans 8, 15, we will not be kicked out. 
When God starts a work, he finishes it. Philippians 1.6. Rabbi, if this is so, then why does the Bible sternly warn us against apostasy? What is apostasy? If you don't know what apostasy is, how can you ask that question? Apostasy, according to the Bible, the Bible defines apostates as people who made professions of faith in Messiah Yeshua, but have never genuinely received him as Lord and Savior. That's the biblical definition. I know some of you are struggling with this. I get it. You know what a lot has to do with? Self-hatred, not being able to forgive yourself. And guess what happens when you can't forgive yourself? You can't forgive nobody else. Which is the core of our faith. The core of our faith is forgiveness, reconciliation, and restoration. Yeah. That, my friends, is the heart of my father. Yeah. How could you profess Yeshua and yet not be born again? Easy. You profess Yeshua, but you're not born again. Do we have an example in the Bible? Yeshua gave us a parable of the wheat and the tares. Yes. It's, it's, it's the quintessential. It illustrates this perfectly. In fact, you know what the most common tear is in Israel? You've got to realize he's in Israel. He's Jewish. His whole audience is in Israel. He's not speaking about a tear in America. Not 2,000 years ago. He's referring to the tares in, in Israel. The tear in Israel is called the bearded darnel. The bearded darnel. It's a poisonous grass. Can you imagine? And it's indistinguishable from the wheat. And the two grow together in a blade and they look identical. But when they come into ear, into maturity, then they can be separated without difficulty. That's why Yeshua says, don't, don't be a weed whacker, be a seed sower. I'll, I'll take care of the weeds. That's not your job. You know how a lot of us think we're Messiah's cops? You got in by the grace of God, then you stand at the door and go, not so fast. And then you monitor it. Who died and left you king? Right. Sir, who died and left you king? The last time I checked, we were subject to his kingship. Yeah. But it is possible, guys, more than possible, to attend a church, to serve in the ministry. To call yourself a Christian and still be unsaved. You can hear the word. You can agree with its truth. You can shout amen and not take it to heart. So the question shouldn't be, Rabbi, can we lose our salvation? The question should be, Rabbi, are we saved? If you knew the love of God, you wouldn't run around. Asking yourself, can I lose it? And you wouldn't be licentious because you would treasure it as the greatest gift you've ever gotten. And you would honor it. And you would, honor, you want, would I want to honor the gift giver in all that you do. That's where I am today. Somebody wants to tell me something I preached 18 years ago? I'm not interested. I'm not interested. This is the day the Lord has made, and I'm going to rejoice in it today. Tomorrow, I don't know. Yesterday, I don't know. I don't want to talk about it. What did you do yesterday? I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I'm here right now. Look at Leviticus is a very important book, guys. If you look at Gematria, you'll see crazy things. I used to teach it, but I don't teach it anymore. Because when you start teaching Gematria, you look mystical. And people love mystical people. They love them. They think they have some secret knowledge or they're gifted by God or they're prophetic. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And people started looking at me like that. And I said to the Lord, I'm done with that. I'm going to teach it straight. I'm not doing that. I don't want that. I don't want that. But Gematria, every word, every letter in Hebrew has a numerical equivalent. And every number has a word association. So if you take things like the first letter in Genesis, the first letter in Genesis, and then you count 49 and you take the 50th letter, count 49, take the 100th letter, you'll get the word Torah. 
you'll see the same thing in Exodus, not in Leviticus. Then if you look at Numbers, five books, if you look at Numbers and Deuteronomy, and you do the same thing, first letter count 49, it says Torah backwards. So it looks like Genesis and Exodus are pointing to the Torah, and Numbers and Deuteronomy is pointing back to the Torah. Leviticus, you go every seven. And what do you get? yud heh vav -Heh. The Torah is God. God is the Torah. It's his heart. So it's crucial. And there's a section that I don't know what the Jews are reading. <laughs> I mean, I love my people. I'm the, I'm the one that will stick up for my people no matter what. But when they need a shot in the head, I'll do it too. Because I'm not a parent in denial. Some of us are in denial. My daughter's the greatest. No, she's not. <laughs> nope. She's not. <laughs> Yeshua is the greatest. Yeah. Your daughter's right. <laughs> Look at... Look at Leviticus 17. This is quintessential, this scripture. Yeah. You should know it by heart. Yeah. It says, when someone from the community of Israel or one of the foreigners living with you eats any kind of blood. Now, have you been anywhere where they drink blood? I have. I preached to the Maasai tribe in Kenya. They're, 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 look them up. M-A-S-S-A-I, Maasai tribe in Kenya. I sat with them in their loincloths, and they offered me their blood. They took it right out of the cow right in front of me. They claim it gives them longevity, long life. Blood will give you long life, but not that blood. I was introducing them to another blood. Yeah. I will set myself against that person who eats blood and cut him off from his people. That's strong language. For the life of a creature is in the blood, and I have given it to you. I have given you the blood on the altar to make atonement for yourselves. For it is the blood that makes atonement because of the life. No blood, no remission of sin, period. You can do tefillah, tzedakah, teshuva all day long. No blood, no remission. That's not New Testament. That's Leviticus. The eating of blood was strictly forbidden, obviously, in the first verse. Because the blood was used exclusively for atonement. Excuse me. The principle behind atonement is life for life. Why? Because the wages of sin is death. And that's symbolized by the shedding of blood. Since the wages of sin is death, symbolized by the shedding of blood, without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. There is no remission. Sin took the life... So life must be given. Forgiveness doesn't come, guys. Forgiveness doesn't come because the penalty of sin is excused. No. God doesn't excuse it. It can't be brushed under the rug. It can't be excused. The penalty of sin is, is, is transferred. It has to be transferred. In Hebrew, they know this, the Jews. There has to be a zobach. There has to be a substitute to take the hit. It has to be transferred. That's why they lay hands on it. Yeah. Why are they laying hands? For identity. They're saying, this goat, this bullock, yeah. he's taken the sin. It has to be transferred. Your sin has to be transferred. If you don't transfer the sin, it's on you. Every day of the week. Now, Hebrews 9, 19 through 20, 22. I'll read it to you, okay? Okay, it says... After Moshe had proclaimed every command, this is Hebrews. Who is Hebrews written to? Messianic Jews. It was written to Jews in the first century because you know why? They were being pulled by the Judaizers and the non-Messianic Jews to come back to Judaism. They were being pulled. They were saying things like, we have the covenants. What do they have? We have the sacrificial system. What do they have? We have the temple. What do they have? After Moshe had proclaimed every command of the Torah to all the people, he took the blood of the calves with some water and used scarlet wool and isop to sprinkle both the scroll itself and all the people. And he said, this is the blood of the covenant which God has ordained you. So this happened in the Torah. Anybody know where? Exodus 24. Judy, you're the best. You have, listen to me. Judy, stand up a minute. This lady is a legitimate scholar. She has read thousands of books and she's a scholar. People don't know that about her because she just sits there 
and, and just minds her own business pretty much. She knows the Bible the way we should know the Bible. How did you learn it so well? I read it, Rabbi. Go figure. <laughs> In fact, it says, according to the Torah, almost everything is purified with blood. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. So he's quoting in Hebrews, Leviticus 17. He's saying to these Messianic Jews, don't forget. Don't forget how you got in. You didn't get in through your bar mitzvah. You didn't get in through not eating pork. Nope. Don't forget because you're going to become very angry and you're not going to be joyful in your salvation like you once were. Anybody know what I'm talking about? All covenants must be ratified in blood. All five ratified in blood. The sacrifice gives great value to the covenant. It also speaks of the importance and the severity in keeping the covenant. There has to be a value. Blood must be shed. There is no exception. He's talking about Exodus 24. Let me read it to you. So you know that the book of Hebrews isn't making a reference to Torah when it's not in the Torah. It says, to Moshe, Adonai said, come up to Adonai. You, Aaron, his brother, Nadab and Abihu, if you have your Bibles, if you have your apps or whatever you have, you can take a look. And the 70 elders of Israel, prostrate yourself at a distance. While Moses alone approaches Adonai, the others are not to approach and the people are not to go up with him. So Moses was on Mount Sinai when God spoke to him the laws and the ordinances. And where do we find that? Exodus chapter 20 to 23. He spoke the whole thing to him. And now he's ready to leave the mountain and give it to the people. Let the people know what God spoke. But God told him to return with Aaron and his two sons and the 70 leaders of Israel. However, only Moses was allowed to draw close to God. When it says a distance, it didn't mean Moses goes up to the mountain and they hang at the mountain. Not even the base of the mountain, like, stay far away. Why? Why didn't Moses go up to the mountain and the people had to stay far away? Distance must be maintained between the sinner and God. Every time we sin, guys, we create distance between us and God. Every time. And if we stop repenting, the distance gets greater and greater. The beautiful thing is when we do repent, back together again. But people say, Rabbi, I'm not hearing God's voice. I don't feel him. You ha you're probably, probably distant. You know, some people say, I feel distant lately, even in their marriage or their friendships or with their family. I feel distant. It didn't just happen. It happens. We can create a distance between us and God. It's, it's very easy to do. Actually, too easy to do. Moses wrote down all the words of Adonai. I'm reading verse 4. He rose early in the morning. He built an altar at the base of the mountain and set 12 large stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. He builds an altar. There's going to be sacrifice. He sent his young men of the people of Israel to offer burnt offerings, sacrifice peace offerings of oxen to Adonai. Moses took half of the blood and put it in the basins. The other half he splashed against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, read it aloud so that the people could hear. And then Moses took the blood and sprinkled the people. He said, this is the blood of the covenant, which Adonai has made in accordance with all these words. So Moses descends the mountain to give the law to the people, right? He's the mediator. This is what I heard. Let me tell you what I heard. This is what God expects of you, okay? There's a covenant being made, an agreement. We make agreements all the time, right? I'll meet you for lunch tomorrow, 12 o'clock. Will you be there? I'll be there. It's an agreement. It's an agreement. So they're making, God's making an agreement. He's ratifying this conditional covenant. It's conditional. There's conditions to it. Yeah. Moses builds an altar with 12 pillars representing the 12 tribes of Israel. He takes the blood and he sprinkles it on the altar representing God's part. God's going to do his part. What's God going to do for us? He's going to protect us. He's going to watch over us. He's going to direct us. He's going to help us. He's going to do so many things. He's going to be our God, right? But then we have part. There's a human side to this, a divine side, a human side to this covenant. He put, he, now, when it says sprinkle, what do we think? 
It's cute. That's the word in English, but that's not the word in Hebrew. In Hebrew, it's zorach, and it means to scatter abundantly. He threw the blood on them. Doused them with the blood. All over them. This is crazy, though. I'm sure you've seen this, so forgive me for getting excited about a revelation. But then in verse 9, it says, Moshe, Aaron, and Nadab and Abihu, and the 70 leaders went up. They saw the God of Israel. Under his feet was something like sapphire stone, pavement as clear as the sky itself, like the re revelation. <laughs> he did not reach out his hand against these notables of Israel. They should have died, right? In his presence. On the contrary. Oh, my God. This is crazy. I'm getting crazy. This is crazy. This is, this is Exodus 24, guys. It says, on the contrary, they saw God. They were eating and drinking with him. What changed? Rabbi's question is, what changed? What happened? What happened between the time they had to stay at a distance and now they're hanging out with God? What happened? Boom. Kiddo, I'm a big fan of righteousness. You know what I do. I set up orphanages. I go around the world and helping people, right? But all those acts of righteousness will not take away what the blood has done for me. All right, that is not the message. I know, but it's not. I would like to give you the message. Would you like the message? How many drove here more than an hour? How many more than two? Yeah, it would be an insult to you to have a 30-minute service. An insult. I had another holy visitation at the cross recently. I was in Florida a couple of weeks ago visiting a doctor. And I used to live there, so I was thrown with many people. Some uh, people that I used to witness to are now evangelists in some really rough countries like Vietnam and other places like this. So they wanted to get together for dinner. This one wanted to get together for lunch, and I did not have time. I went down there to see a doctor, but I also went down there to spend time with my father. And every day went by, and I was really getting frustrated. And it was my last day, my very last day. And I said, Lord, I just got to get with you, man. This is killing me. So I woke up at like 4.30, went to the beach, my old commune place, my prayer closet, and I just beat the sun, rise again. You know, I love doing that. I love beating the sun because the sun loves to try to beat me and praise. I love beating him. <laughs> and I was praising him, praising him. Then all of a sudden, I remember this little church called Salty Church that opened up. You know, they have a ministry just to surface, and it's beautiful. You know, they get to them, and they had a little 7 o'clock service, so they start singing, and I'm like, man, the Holy Spirit was so there. It just done pressed down like a glory cloud, man like Hakavod, and I, I couldn't even stand. So then I said, okay, what do we do now, Lord? He goes, come take a walk with me. So I walked along the shore, sun started to rise, and uh, out of nowhere, I had a verse, a voice say, you're all right, you're all right, Greg. You're all right. Now, that might not sound like much to you, but if you knew me, you would know how much that was. I couldn't believe it, guys. I couldn't believe that God said you're all right. It was incredible. It was like, like hearing it was the greatest thing I've ever heard in my life. I've always tried to prove my worth. I've always tried to do works of righteousness over and over again just to let God know you didn't waste your blood on me. And so that's what I did my whole life for 30 years. Somebody call me, I'm there. Somebody, you know, just got to be there because I got to prove myself. It was so freeing. I called Bernadette immediately. I said, Bernie, you're not going to believe it. I just heard God say, you're all right. What he was saying to me, I think, is like, look, I love that you're partaking in my work. I love that you're doing this. But, son, I, I won't love you any more, and I won't love you any less than I do right now. 
I began to think that maybe I'm not alone. I thought, what do people want more than anything? They want to be loved. They want to be accepted. Maybe even desired. Desired. And I thought, who better to get that love and acceptance from than the one who made us? I'm watching our young people get sucked into the world of approval and disapproval through social media. I've never been on Facebook. I've never been on Instagram. I don't know what a Snapchat is. I know that somebody told me, Rabbi, a forum like Twitter, there's thousands of people that watch you. They would like to hear so. I meditate every morning like I do anyway. It's nothing for me. Twitter's nothing. After the meditation, I write something. I just write something. Whatever comes out this morning, I'll tell you what I wrote. I think it's appropriate for this discussion. That's why I brought my phone in. Otherwise, I don't bring it. I said, friends, views, likes, hits, followers, and subscribers. I have a friend that sticks closer to me than a brother. He views me from on high because he likes me. So much so that he took the hit for me. So now I follow him and subscribe to his ways. This crazy approval, this, this focus on the external, the number one, the number one, the death rate in the teenage community is suicide. That is abominable. And somebody told me just recently, some kids go online to say they're going to commit suicide. You know what the other kids yell? What? Get them off social media. They're never going to be happy in their room, a little overweight, struggling with, struggling with some facial issues that we all do when we're teenagers, and seeing Paris Hilton on the Amalfi Coast driving a Lamborghini and thinking, I got a good life. Don't let the external fool you. It's, it's, it's like Pete Townsend said, it's an eminence front. It's a put on. It's a put on. Driving the fancy car, having the nice house, and inside there's no love and misery. It's not real joy. Because if you get joy from those things, and those things get taken away, so does your joy. I want to read you something. Do we have the, uh, oh look, it's back up. Isn't that nice? Do we have the illustrations? It's a quick short story. The Wemmicks were small wooden people. All of the wooden people were carved by a woodworker named Eli. His workshop sat on a hill overlooking their village. Each Wemmick was different. Some had big noses, others had large eyes, some were tall and others were short. Some wore hats, others wore coats, but all were made by the same carver and all lived in the village. And all day, every day, the Wemmicks did the same thing. They gave each other stickers. Each Wemmick had a box of Golden Star stickers and a box of Grey Dot stickers. Up and down the streets all over the city, people spent their days sticking stars or dots on one another. The pretty ones, those with smooth wood and fine paint, always got stars. But if the wood was rough or the paint chipped, the Wemmicks gave dots. The talented one got stars too. Some could lift big sticks high above their heads or jump over tall boxes. Still others knew big words or could sing pretty songs. Everyone gave them stars. Some Wemmicks had stars all over them. Every time they got a star, it made them feel so good. It made them want to do something else and get another star. Others, though, could do little, and they got dots. Puccinello was one of these. He tried to jump high like the others, but he always fell. And when he fell, the others would gather around and give him dots. Sometimes when he fell, his wood got scratched, so the people would give him more dots. Then when he would try to explain why he fell, he would say something silly, and the Wemmicks would give him even more dots. After a while, he had so many dots that he didn't want to go outside. 
He was afraid he would do something dumb, such as forget his hat or step in the water, and then people would give him another dot. In fact, he had so many gray dots that some people would come up and give him a dot for no reason at all. He deserves lots of dots, the wooden people would agree with one another. He's not a good wooden person. After a while, Punchinello believed them. I'm not a good Wemmick, he would say. The few times he went outside, he hung around other Wemmicks who had a lot of dots. He felt better around them. One day he met a Wemmick who was unlike any he'd ever met. She had no dots or stars. She was just wooden. Her name was Lucia. It wasn't that people didn't try to give her stickers. It's just that the stickers didn't stick. Some of the Wemmicks admired Lucia for having no dots, so they would run up and give her a star, but it would fall off. Others would look down on her for having no stars, so they would give her a dot, but it wouldn't stay either. That's the way I want to be, thought Punchinello. I don't want anybody's marks. So he asked the stickerless Wemmick how she did it. It's easy, Lucia replied. Every day, I go see Eli. Eli. Yes, Eli, the woodcarver. I sit in the workshop with him. Why? Why don't you find out for yourself? Go up the hill, he's there. And with that, the women who had no stickers turned and skipped away. But will he want to see me? Punchinello cried out. Lucia didn't hear. So Punchinello went home. He sat near a window and watched the wooden people as they scurried around, giving each other stars and dots. It's not right, he muttered to himself. And he decided to go see Eli. walked up the narrow path to the top of the hill and stepped inside the big shop. His wooden eyes widened at the size of everything. The stool was as tall as he was. He had to stretch on his tiptoes to see the top of the workbench. A hammer was long as his arm. Punchinello swallowed hard. I'm not staying here. And he turned to leave. Then he heard his name. Punchinello? The voice was deep and strong. Punchinello stopped. Punchinello, how good to see you. Come and let me have a look at you. Punchinello turned slowly and looked at the large bearded craftsman. You know my name? The little one that asked. Of course I do. I made you. Eli stooped down and picked him up. Sat him on the bench. Hmm. The maker spoke thoughtfully. As he looked at the gray dots, looks like you've been given some bad marks. I didn't mean to, Eli. I really tried hard. Oh, you don't have to defend yourself to me. Chop, I don't care what the other women think. You don't? No. And you shouldn't either. Who are they to give stars or dots? They're women just like you. What they think doesn't matter, Punchinello. All that matters is what I think. And I think you're pretty special. Punchinello laughed. Me special? Why? I, I can't walk fast. I can't jump. My paint is peeling. What do I matter to you? Eli looked at Punchinello, put his hands on the small wooden shoulders, and spoke very slowly. Because you're mine. That's why you matter to me. Punchinello had never had anyone look at him like this, much less his maker. He didn't know what to say. Every day I've been hoping you'd come, Eli explained. I came because I met someone who had no mark, said Punchinello. I know. She told me about you. Why don't the stickers stay on her? The maker spoke softly because she has decided that what I think is more important than what they think. 
The stickers only stick if you let them. What? The stickers only stick if they matter to you. The more you trust my love, the less you care about their stickers. I'm, I'm not sure I understand. Eli smiled. You will, but it will take time. You've got a lot of marks. For now, just come to see me every day. And let me remind you how much I care. Eli lifted Punchinello off the bench and set him on the ground. Remember, Eli said, as the Wemmick walked out the door, I made you. You're special, and I don't make mistakes. Punchinello didn't stop, but in his heart he thought, I think he really means it. And when he did, a dot fell to the ground. Now, I've told you... <coughs> just about every occasion since I've been here. you got to fall in love with God. <laughs> it's nice to <coughs> obligate yourself to try to walk in his ways. There is no freedom in that. It's like walking a tightrope with alligators underneath you. You're going to fall. But when you fall in love with God, it's a delight to live according to his ways. It's a delight. It's, it's easy. It's easy because you're so in love with him and he's so in love with you. Why would you want to put distance between you and him? You know, as I progress with God, I fall more and more in love with him. I fall more in love with Bernadette. I fall more in love with my kids. I fall more in love with the lost. I fall more in love with you. The more I receive from him, the more I'm able to give out. You know some of you when you're married and you're laying in a bed together and there's a million miles of distance between the two of you. And it's horrible. It's painful. Painful, some of the worst pain there is. You don't want to have that distance between you and God. But the woodworker told him, Come see me every day. Guys, I can't do that part for you. I, I've really tried, but I like it's hasn't worked. You have to see God every day. I don't know when that's going to work for you, but you have to daily spend time with the Lord. It's, it's, it's crucial. It's crucial to your happiness and your joy. There's so much depression today. There's so much sadness. Too much. Way too much. Rabbi, it's a terrible world out there. It's always been a terrible world out there, but it's good in here. There's a, um, a rabbi that you probably don't know. You probably don't know a lot of rabbis, right? Even most Jewish people don't know this rabbi, Rabbi Nachman of Breslov. He was the um, great-grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, who was the founder of the Hasidic movement. And I don't go there usually because they're very involved in Kabbalah, and although there is things to glean from Kabbalah, sometimes it's a little too mystical, so I'm careful, but let me show you what this guy said, this Rabbi Nachman. This is hard to, this is hard to swallow. He said, the day you were born is the day God decided that the world could not exist without you. <coughs> now, let me tell you the Breslov. It's not a place, although there is an area in Ukraine where he lived, but let me explain to you their me his methodology. He was laughed out. He lost four of his children. He died of tuberculosis at 38. And he was kind of pushed out of the Hasidic movement. Because Hasidim in English means piety, holiness. L let me tell you his approach, okay? His approach, and, and when I read this a while ago, I thought, I don't know. I feel like I have a lot in common with him, just based on his philosophy. He put great emphasis on serving God through the sincerity of the heart. 
It was very personal. He took joy in living life as intensely as possible. Living life. You know, if he has burned that, every day you try to make it like a theme for the day. I don't know when, you know, my dad told me, kid, live every, li- live every day like it's your last because one day it's going to be. He told me when I was five, that's what I heard. The Breslov teachings emphasize emunah, faith, as a means to teshuva, repentance. And he said, every Jew on any level of divine service is required to constantly yearn to return to God. He says, every Jew, every Yehuda, every praiser of God, this is the 1700s, by the way. He said, it's the job of a true Jew that if he feels any distance between him and get to want to bridge that gap. I mean, Ephesians 2 says the same thing. No? You lost your first love. You're so involved in reading and telling and doing, but your motivation is off. He says that the fulfillment of Torah, the the objective of his Torah, is to live a joyful existence with God. This is what he said. This is what he said in the 1700s. He said that even leading intellectuals, 1700s, in the medical field, what did they know back then? A test to depression and bitterness being the main cause of most mental ailments. Mind-boggling so many years ago, right? Rabbi Nachman, and this is what hit me, guys, and this is what I want you to see here. I'm almost done. I'm almost done, I promise. I know it's, it's rough. Rebbe Nachman advised his followers to engage in hit bodetut, which is Hebrew for self-seclusion, on a daily basis. He's saying you have to, every day, get alone with God. That's where your strength is going to come from. Not just in another Bible study, not just in another fellowship. Alone. This was his strength. This was his forte. If you asked him if he was alive, and you said, what was your forte with the Lord? Self-seclusion. But he loved people, and he had eight kids. He had. He lost four, but Rabbi Nachman claimed that every true tzaddik, that's a righteous man, attains his spiritual level uniquely because of self-seclusion. I've told you this thousands of times, that if I have any strength, it comes from seclusion with the Lord. It doesn't come from just reading the Bible. I do read the Bible, but not nearly as much as you think. I study a few words, but not nearly as much as you think. I pray, but not nearly as much as you think. But meditate in God's presence? Forget about it. Tomorrow morning, I guarantee you, I'll wake up at 5 o'clock. I guarantee you, I won't come out of it until about 4 in the afternoon. Ask my kids. And it will go by like that. That's where I get my marching orders. He says, during self-seclusion... The individual pours out his thoughts and concerns to God as if he was talking to a close personal friend. They couldn't handle him because he wasn't pious enough. Last two verses, Matthew 26, 27, 28. He took a cup of wine, made the bracha, and gave it to them, saying, all of you drink from it, for this is my blood which ratifies the new covenant, my blood shed on behalf of many so that they may have their sins forgiven. Guys, not only do we get to commune with God, commune with God. Commune with God. Talk to God and hear him. Commune with God, almighty God. But we get to bring glory to his name every day by helping to repair this torn and tattered world that we live in. That's our job. Tikkun ha'olam, repair the world. Jesus has left the building. Buddy, look at me. Jesus is gone. You know who's left? You. It's just not a song we sing. I want to be your hands. I want to be your feet. Great song. The cup spoke beautifully about his precious blood that would be poured out of Golgotha. He spoke of it just like Moses did, the cup of the new covenant. It's the same story throughout. 
This means that the new covenant, we new covenant believe is, this is ratified by his blood. When we repent and truly see him as Lord and Savior, he sprinkles, throws, throws the blood on the doorpost and lintel of our heart, not our physical heart, our spiritual heart, the essence of who we are. Therefore, if that's you, know this, you are blood washed, you are blood bought, you are blood justified, you are blood sanctified, and you are blood safe. Somebody say hallelujah. We have to be so secure in the cleansing power of the blood of Yeshua that our conscience no longer condemns us. We have been smeared with the blood of Messiah, and now the angel of death must pass over. But during this season of deliverance, saints, my hope and my prayer is that the spirit of fear and condemnation will pass over us as well. Chag Sameach, Shabbat Shalom, let's stand together. Did you notice how the screens went down yes. and then the miraculous came up? Because yes. the message was the book. Yes. Don't miss what God was doing. Yes. It was worth every hour that I wrestled. I am so incredibly thankful right now. You have no idea. Bernard that's in New York. My other two kids are living in New York. My other two have something to do this afternoon. I'm going to sit in seclusion at his feet and kiss him. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. And may the Lord lift up his very countenance upon you and give you peace in the name of the Prince of Peace, Yeshua. Yivarecha Adonai v'yishmerecha Yor Adonai p'na v'lecha v'hunecha Yes, I don't know how I Shalom. Shabbat shalom, guys. <laughs>